Well, we just finished sulfides, so you better bet next up is the sulfates. There's fewer minerals to worry about in the family of the sulfates, but the ones that are there are super important. In the textbook, this is pages 403 to 405, and then the systematic mineralogy part is 420 to 425. Our general characteristics that are shared amongst the whole family, general characteristics, Carrick, I, I should change that, right? I shouldn't, characteristics, general character is what I'm going to start doing now. And then, okay, the general character. Well, what ends up happening is that sulfur loses all the electrons in its, in its valence shell, in its outer shell, and that's six electrons. And that produces a cation. Is that right? Yeah, it produces basically a cation of sulfur 6 plus. That cation, sulfur 6 plus, will bond with four different um, oxygen, two minuses, to create in a tetrahedral arrangement a molecule of SO4 2 minus. Okay, where that sulfur's in the middle and then tetrahedrally arranged around it are our oxygens. All right, with that two minus charge. So that is the basic structure building block of all the sulfite, sulfates. And these are sedimentary minerals. Yes, they can form in other ways, but most of the time these are in sedimentary sequences. Some hydrothermal alteration is acceptable here as well. There are three minerals we're gonna go through today. The big three, we'll start with barite. Really, it's just a big two with a little asterisk after barite with a mineral called celestite that's very similar to barite. The chemical formula for barite is BaSO4, and its mineralogy, um, what does it have? It's got a hardness of three. That is not uncommon for minerals that look like barite. What do I mean when I say minerals that look like barite? Well, these, this tends to be clear maybe gray, it tends to be vitreous, it's non-metallic, non-metallic. So saying something has a hardness of three that fits those criteria is not unusual. But what it does have is a specific gravity of 4.5, which is very heavy. So let's put a little asterisk up here by 4.5 and just say heavy for a non-metallic luster. In fact, the the Greek root of this word is baris, and baris means heavy in Greek. So that's what I want you to be thinking about when you think about barons, that this is a very heavy mineral. It does have uh, a perfect cleavage that occurs on um, tabular crystals. So tabular crystals are the most common form, but other common forms include just massive barite, or something called the Desert Rose. Isn't that a song by Sting? Probably before your time. Well, here's what I mean by barite crystal form. We can see here on the left an example with tabular, non-metallic, clear crystals. And here is a beautiful example of a Desert Rose. And you can see why now. And these are common in states like Oklahoma. It's worthy to put in your rock collection if you ever get a chance to find one. Another characteristic of barite is that it does have a perfect cleavage. The geology of barite is twofold. Geology is that it, it can be gang or gossan, right, the garbage in a hydrothermal ore system. That's because sulfides are turning into the sulfate, barite, in the oxidized region above the water table. The other way that it's going to form, as in as is veins or pods in limestone sequences. And the big time geologic significance of barite is that it's used in hydrocarbon exploration and drilling for oil mostly, and that is as a heavy mud. So the significance, if you have a big deposit of barite on your land, well, someone's probably approached you so that they can mine it to make a heavy mud, where they will mix it in with water and other things to create a mud that's heavier than normal mud, 
because the specific gravity of 4.5, and that will help displace oil, water, natural gas in the drilling industry. Now, cousin to barite is a mineral called celestite. And we're going to put that down here. We're not going to go through it in the most formal way, but I do want to put down celestite. It has a chemical formula, SRSO4. And what ends up happening is that there is a barium to strontium solid solution between these two minerals. And sometimes they're really hard to tell apart. So for the purposes of our class, celestite is going to look like the celestial sky colored blue or we could say an icy blue color and when we see that celestial sky blue we're going to use that color to say um, that it is celestite and not barite even though that at a higher level might not be entirely true because of this solid solution in the rock record it's occurring in limestones just like barite where the strontium is coming from seawater. I have a picture here to show you what I mean by that color. Here's what it is. See that icy blue color? It might even be a little lighter color than this and still be okay. But that's that celestial icy blue for celestite. Now, it feels like we're racing on through the sulfates, but that's okay. Short videos are better than long even though I get to talking too much. And the last mineral we're gonna deal with is gypsum, which has a chemical formula, CaSO4 dot 2H2O. And this H2O is really important um, with gypsum, and you must include it in the chemical formula. When gypsum loses the 2H2O, it's actually called a different mineral, which is called anhydrite, which is its cousin. So gypsum is a very common mineral in sedimentary sequences. It, it can occur as a primary evaporite deposit, or it can be remobilized through a variety of different hydrothermal processes. When I think about gypsum in the rock record, I'm thinking about sedimentary rocks like this, and we may see chunks of gypsum weathering out of you know dirty old soils. In this example, there's a vein of gypsum that's going through this sedimentary rock. So what we're gonna do, let's um let's introduce gypsum with the normal structure with mineralogy. It is the most important probably for identifying gypsum is its hardness is two. This means it can be scratched with a fingernail, and this is one of the softest minerals we deal with in mineralogy class. So this is scratched with fingernail. The color of gypsum is it is white to clear. Most of the time, let's say 90% of the time, we could put a little caveat here that says unless it's been stained by some kind of impurities. The next thing I want to do is, I've got to tell you, there are actually three different types of gypsum. There's a variety called selenite, there's a variety called alabaster, and there is a variety called satin spar. And I'm introducing those three to you with these pictures. And what do they each have is a different crystal habit. So underneath these pictures, I'm going to put the word selenite, I'm going to put the word alabaster, and then it is satin spar. And this crystal habit is in part controlled by the geologic process that's making them. So for selenite, this is the tabular crystalline variety of gypsum. So tabular and crystalline. When we think of crystals of gypsum, this is what we think about. It has a perfect basal cleavage, which we can see in this picture here, 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 and here. And then the other edges, notice how irregular they are. Well, and especially in this case, this, these are actually crystal faces. But the direction that is not the perfect basal cleavage has an irregular, like conchoidal type fracture. So we're gonna say tabular crystalline with perfect basal cleavage. That perfect basal cleavage will allow it to break into flakes like we see here, all right, but 
fracture in other directions. The alabaster variety is massive to earthy. This is because it's composed of very, very finely intergrown clusters of crystals. Notice that it is clear white. All of them are that way. Uh, the geologic occurrence of the alabaster variety, this tends to be more of an evaporite, whereas, I'm not sure I'm comfortable saying what selenite is, it can either, because there's so many different things, right? It can be hydrothermal, it can be replacement. Basically, we need a little bit more open space in order to get the selenite variety to crystallize. Satin spar is our fibrous variety fibrous variety of gypsum and it's supposed to have a silky luster for, because of the aligned fibers of gypsum. Now above 70 degrees, we'll just make a, like kind of a note here, this is like a, a following note, not under gypsum or not under selenite specifically or alabaster or satin spar, but any of them at above 70 degrees the H2O is driven off. In a chemical reaction. And so the H2O is driven off. And what that does is it makes a new mineral called anhydrite. Which is similar to gypsum in many ways. It's harder than gypsum. It's denser than gypsum. Because it, we've lost, right, we've anhydrated it. Oh, and the chemical formula for anhydrite is just CaSO4. And that's a mineral that you're held accountable for. SO4. Now, the geology, or the geology and significance, we can finish with that with gypsum. So geology, I almost just want you to say, like, expect it everywhere. And you probably should, especially in geologic, um, especially in sedimentary sequences. But there are a couple really special places on Earth that have a lot of gypsum. One of them is a place called White Sands in New Mexico, and the other is the Nica Crystal Caves in Mexico. These are two of the most spectacular. They're like natural wonders of the world, and it's thanks to gypsum. So this one's called White Sands. It's a national park in New Mexico where alabaster evaporite sequences in nearby Arizona and New Mexico are eroding and, and, and are blowing sands. And so there are these dune fields that are composed entirely of gypsum sands. And then in the Nanaika Crystal Caves, hydrothermal systems have precipitated gypsum crystals as big as have ever been found on the planet. And so you can see these little these little explorers down in this cave deep in the subsurface, and we can imagine the hydrothermal fluid pouring through this large fissure, creating these crystals that look like they're from the age of dinosaurs. Just totally spectacular geologic occurrence of gypsum. Our significance of gypsum has to do with construction, and, and really it's that reaction of that 70 degrees and driving off water and forming an hydrate to gypsum or gypsum to anhydrate, well, chemists have figured out how to take advantage of that reaction and they use it to make plaster, used in plaster, where you add water and you dry off water to change the mineralogy and it will harden to form something that we can use to build and also sheetrock. These are some of the things you'll buy that have gypsum in them all the time. And that's it for sulfates. Next up, carbonates.